excuse me, interruption, uh, the uh, musical uh, performance group, Saturday's Children, if you would please be at the chorus room uh, at this point uh, for the bus. Okay. Saturday's Children, please report to the chorus room. Thanks. Or, uh, I gotta go. You know, but I'll say it's always harder than you think to go. Microphone speak. Uh, uh, once. You don't, you're looking at a microphone. A couple things. First off, so what's going to happen is all of your teachers who talk about this, and your professors or anybody else who's taking anything like this, they've all been molded by the Cold War. And you might think, well, and so that leads us to, you know, you think you'll be different. Well, but you'll still be in that same kind of train of thought. But the other thing I was going to say is it is definitely changing. It is definitely changing. And the Cold War fears that I had growing up, the fears of communism and nuclear war, are not in your generation as much. I mean, you're still kind of being taught this and it's being hammered, but it's not happening in the same effect. I mean, when you get more younger people than ever before say socialism isn't a bad idea, but you would have said that when I was a kid. You would have branded it as a commie, I mean, ostracized. Did I say, oh, yeah. So it's, it's changing. But I don't know. You know, you still, it still affects us to this day. Well, obviously, therefore, it's a fight between East and West, Soviet Union, United States. When I was a kid, I always talked about the free world and the enslaved world. A map would be blue and red to signify the different sides. That's why this map is so frustrating. Why did they choose green and orange? Come on! And we talked about this before, but just a quick review. Remember Yalta? In many ways, that January 1945 meeting at Yalta, in a lot of ways, you could argue, was the beginning of the Cold War. Yeah, this map, purple and green. Really? When I was a kid, it was always red and green, or red and blue. Always. All these maps and every magazine, everything else. Well, Yalta. Yeah, that was red and green. Yeah, that was like the same outcome. And we've already talked about the main issues of this, but it fits in this. Remember Stalin promised elections in Eastern Europe? Did he deliver? Yeah. No, he wanted a buffer zone. But of course, this is going to be the beginnings of what they call them, satellite nations. And then eventually, Winston Churchill would popularize a term for it. All these countries that would become part of this buffer zone, what would he call this one? They're behind a what? Iron Curtain. Exactly. That's what the Iron Curtain. And we'll, I'll, talk, I'll mention this again on Monday, but Iron Curtain, he didn't make up the term, but it, he made it popular. Had a, had a talk of what? Southwest Missouri State? Well, also in this, that is where they said, I believe I mentioned this yesterday, they would occupy Germany, or Germany would be divided and split up into four occupation zones. Four occupation zones. And so there would be Soviet, then British, US, and then the British and US demanded the French get an occupation zone. And so that's not just it. Austria too would be occupied that way. But the big one for this fight, Berlin also. And the thing about Berlin, Berlin was in the middle of the Soviet occupation zone. Berlin was liberated, or whatever you want to call it, by the Soviets. But Berlin's going to have a Soviet occupation zone, and then from north to south, British, French, the US. When I was a kid, that would become East and West Germany. I mean, sorry, East and West Berlin. And my. My sister-in-law married a Berliner, lives in Berlin, and he grew up in the American occupation zone. Even though it's part of West Berlin, they had self-government, but he was, I mean, it was the American zone. And so in the middle of the Soviet occupation zone is going to be a Western occupied part of Berlin right here. And there's going to be three corridors. Railroad, railroad and air corridor. And it was basically the idea would be, okay, the US is gonna put a brigade 
of about 3,000 troops there. The British and French will too. They'll be, and they'll be along a corridor, a road, a railroad, and a route for planes to come into resupply. Yeah. So was Berlin split in four? Hmm? You said yeah, Berlin was split in four too. The, the Russian occupation zone was a little bigger, but still four parts. But it was mainly like east and west. Yeah, well, it's going to become, yeah, it's east and west, and it will become literally known as in the 1950s, okay. east and west Berlin. When I was a kid growing up, it was it, there was no Berlin. It's West Berlin, East Berlin. Could you say the corridors? The corridors are going to be land and air routes to the western occupied occupation zones. So basically, what it, a corridor basically was this road would be the British road, this road would be the American road, this road would be the French road to bring in supplies for their troops. And so after the, the Germans took Berlin, about a month and a half afterwards, right before the Potsdam Conference. Like, for example, the 1st American Brigade, they were from the 2nd Armored Division. They fought all the way from Normandy to the, they finished the war somewhere in central Germany near Frankfurt. They, one brigade, was ordered to the American Occupation Zone and the British Brigade, etc. And that unit, so they, that was a combat unit. They got nice fresh uniforms that looked good and went there. Mr. Long's dad, and Mr. Long in the math department, he was in that unit. He was in that first unit. And so the, the Russians all glared at him. And one funny thing about that. So the Russians liberate the city for Reynolds and Ruins. Horrific fighting in parts of the Black Stock building. And then there's this big park called the Kiergarten. That was just you know, this shell pockmarked place. So the Russians had this ruined town. The first thing they did before the other countries came. So we're talking VE Day, May 8th, end of June. The British, American, and French are coming through their occupation zones. In that month, they built a massive memorial to the Soviet liberation of Berlin, to the Soviet army, in this big park by the Reichstag. It's within inside of the German capital today. This big Soviet memorial. It's hammer and sickle, and they have the first two Soviet tanks to enter the Berlin, supposedly in a big statue of a soldier, big columns. It's huge. And they built it right away. First, they built nothing else first. In the British occupation zone. So when they pulled out, the British had the Soviet memorial, which I think is really fun. If you go there today, the Germans keep it immaculate. This big memorial for the Soviets. There's even a bigger, what, 50 acre memorial in Berlin, too, that the Soviets built. But here, now the thing was, the idea was eventually they come up to unification. There'd be unification somewhere. The four parties, the four countries were occupied. We're supposed to come together. They literally called them the four party talks. And they would talk unification. And there was a real word because this is what you, I've said this before, can't forget this. Stalin was absolutely terrified that the Western powers would rearm Germany and send them back again. He believed, with some justification, that it was the plan of the West, and kind of lost the church in, that Stalin and Hitler. Would destroy each other, and then Britain and the United States would emerge into the power vacuum relatively unscathed while these areas were destroyed. He was just convinced they were going to do it. He was incredibly paranoid. That's why I wanted this buffer zone. Also, promised were reparations. And these reparations were going to be about $20 billion to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was devastated. This area here. And also the areas under soon to be their satellite nations behind the Iron Curtain, destroyed by war, absolutely impoverished. Most of the 30 million refugees in Europe were from here. And so the idea was that they demanded it. We demand $20 billion in reparations from Germany. Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering who was. Yeah, Germany. Now the Western Allies didn't want that because they thought that reparations after World War I. Help lead to the growth of Nazis. Yeah, that's a hell. What treaty? Yeah, two, two, 20 million from Germany to Russia. What treaty? World War One. Versailles. Okay. So, next, we already talked about this. Three months, the, the, the Russians are going to attack Japan, and then a new United Nations is going to be created. And. They knew there was going to be all kinds of war issues. The United Nations, though, would try to solve the problems that 
What's the thing after World War One? U.S. didn't join, trying to be a failure. League of Nations. League of Nations, good. Yeah. So it's this decided at Yalta. Yeah, all this at Yalta. All this is Yalta. Okay. And what was the United Nations? Okay, the United Nations was going to be like another League of Nations. And it was going to be where all the countries of the world could come together in one, they call it the General Assembly, where they could try to use diplomacy and international action to solve problems. And the thing was, the United Nations solved the problems that led to, well, do you remember this big issue before World War I? Collective security. Do you remember the idea of collective security where the countries together will come together to stop aggression? What was that part of the Treaty of Versailles that had the collective security part that pretty much stifled the chance to ratify World War after World War One? Yeah, Article Ten. Article Ten. To solve that problem of collective security that conservatives were very much opposed to. And after World War II, there was a real conservative resurgence in the US. Isolationists. Let's not fight again. How do we get countries like, and also Britain, Britain had the same element there. It's called the Security Council. And this is going to be within the United Nations, and they make all the major decisions, especially about collective security. They're the ones who rule if there is actually aggression that must be stopped. And so, it's taken out of the hands of the General Assembly. At first it was only 11, now it's 15 members. And five are permanent, the rest rotate. Five permanent members, and they all have a veto. So therefore, a country of those, the great powers, cannot be forced. Now clearly it's not going to be Germany and Japan will be one of these permanent members, even though that's an issue today, consider the power of those two countries. The US will be one of those five. The Soviets are the other. What are the other three? No, can we beat them? China, China. 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 And China actually was a country that had been devastated by World War II. And they were actually kind of a, they fought a civil war right before World War II, and they would fight a civil war after. It was not a strong country, but the U.S. Roosevelt wanted China to be a strong country in Asia. Somebody who's not Japan or Russia. Yeah. Uh, so the Security Council like ran everything, including the, the big decisions came out of the Security Council. Okay. The General Assembly actually has no real power. So the Assembly of all the states, you know, all of what 197 states or 198 states today, countries. I think it's 198. I think it's around. Yeah. Do just those five get the veto? Yeah, only those five. Well, the thing is, okay, so the U.S. ratified this treaty. The U.S. became part of the United Nations, unlike the League of Nations. But what kind of things would pass the Security Council? What would pass the Security What would pass the Security Council if five countries have a veto? What kind of things? Nothing. Yeah, nothing controversial ever passes the Security Council. Almost nothing ever ever passes the Security Council because one of these five countries will veto. Think about the Cold War. The U.S., the Britain, or, U.S., Britain, or France would veto everything that might favor the Soviet Union or China. China, and the, or I'm sorry, not China, Soviet Union. Soviet Union would veto everything, everything that the West might want. So that is why, to this day, because of that dynamic, the United Nations is very. It has it can do some little things, but it, it's but a power the United Nations has is always weak because of these people. Yeah. So it only takes one of these countries to do something one. So like for example, the one of the biggest issues from the United Nations is about Israel, the area they occupied uh, that they took from Jordan and Syria and Egypt, Gaza and the West Bank. They still occupied since 1967. Big issue. Every time there's anything to do about the Israel remaining there, the U.S. vetoes it. Immediately. Veto. Nothing happens. So, if anybody says the United Nations is too strong, or the 90s, this was a big deal. Talk of the U.N. taking over the, the world. And black helicopters from the United Nations are taking over the U.S. I'm not kidding. People said this. That's ridiculous. The U.N. The UN has no power. Well, all this came out of Yalta. FDR really believed that he could like charm or 
Stalin. And FDR had one thing, looking back, it seemed ridiculous, but everybody almost liked this. Regardless of how ill he was that January, he could not comprehend that he would die. And so he just he just assumed, even after the war, yeah, Stalin can't be trusted with me. I'll make sure he does what he wants. You know, and people, you know, it's hard. I have great sympathy. You know, it's you just don't think it's gonna happen. So in April, when he did die, you can imagine how the next president came in totally unprepared. Heck, he didn't even know about what's the program, the program to build the atomic bomb. Man, I didn't really yeah. Truman didn't know about it till the next day after he found out he was the president. In fact, he was a compromise choice, and no one even knew who, who the heck Truman was outside of his home state of Missouri. And so he was totally unprepared. But one thing's going to come out of this. FDR is going to be seen more and more as being outmaneuvered. Stalin tricked him, stole from him at Yalta. Yalta was this really big pro, really big pro-communist saying. A lot of people started saying this, that Yalta was really pro-communist, and FDR was either outmaneuvered and tricked because he was old or badly formed, or maybe FDR was really a what? A communist. And this idea that we had this communist element within, and especially a more conservative element especially Republicans. Why Republicans? Because they've been out of office since 1932. And Republicans saw this as a way to say, since FDR was outmaneuvered at Yalta, Republicans could say Democrats were, and the word they would use, soft on communism. Because of Yalta. Now, in reality, Yalta was not that pro-Soviet. And the idea that we could somehow in an agreement get Stalin to do something, it's so ridiculous, it hurts. Stalin had the biggest army in the world. What are we going to do? Attack the Soviet Union because he will not allow free elections in Hungary? Well, we would prove in 1956. No, we're not going to do that in Hungary. Something like that will happen. You're going to blow the world up for Hungary? Sorry, Hungary. I like Hungary. But it won't happen. It's ridiculous to say that. But Yalta is going to become, what's the symbol of a peace man's before World War II? What city? Munich. 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 I know. Munich. Yalta will become like, right down, like Munich. It will be compared to Munich. That is, it's unfair to say Munich is total peace man. And it's totally wrong to say that. But Yalta is going to become political. And this is something that we got to get right here. And I'm going to say it over and over again. So much of the Cold War is actually domestic politics. So much of what the American reaction is has very little to do with what's going on around the world. It's more about politics within the United States. Everybody trying to prove they're not soft on communism. Everybody's trying to prove they're tough. Everyone's going to say they're going to stand up to Stalin or whoever's coming after it. And you'll see the same thing and that same idea would happen. This is a new thing after World War II. It wasn't like this until World War II, after World War II. With terrorists. Same thing. Got to prove you're tough on terrorists. The same idea. That's why the Cold War legacy goes on through today. And so, Yalta, just, just so we don't forget, July of 45, that's that last wartime agreement. It really was a wartime agreement. Potsdam. And remember, this is a Potsdam where a couple things happened. What did Truman tell Stalin happened? Yeah, it was and it worked. <laughs> and why was the Stalin surprised? And he had spies who gave the plans. Very good. And what did Stalin tell Truman? And, and well, Atwood. Huh? Well, actually, that's for the bomb. Oh, good. Hope you use it. What did he say about Eastern Europe? What did Stalin say about Eastern Europe? What? Oh, he said there won't be bombs. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. What can we do? And see, that's the thing. Clearly, there's a lot of reasons to drop the atomic bombs. 
have to do with Japan, unconditional surrender, I mean, all kinds of things you can talk about. But that issue of Russia is still it's a big issue. You know, Very rarely is there any decision made that's just black and white. You know, this happened to this happened. If this happened because of this, there can be a lot of different reasons and considerations and motivations. And people tend to be, this might blow you away, human. And they sometimes make emotional decisions if it's based upon fear or based upon trying to look tough, based upon any sort of, any number of things, personal gain. So Potsdam, you could argue that it was really a cold war. If you get a chance, go to where they met, it's really cool. There's still the big red star that Stalin had planned to make sure everyone knew that the Soviets made this. It's a red star, red star on a flower, red star on a flower. It's really cool. It's a neat place. It's really, it's, um, Potsdam is a, is, a, is a great place. Should we go? Yeah, where is Potsdam? Just outside of Berlin. And they have the big palace where the Prussian kings were. It's kind of like a mini Versailles. Oh, it's really neat. So, with that, we have the dropping of the atomic bombs, and the thing is you have to understand, for average people, they assume this awful war is over, we're going to make a better peace, especially now when we think about the U.S. population. Yeah, they about Stalin's a bad guy, but in reality, everybody thought Stalin's our ally. And they talked about, we're going to get together as United Nations and forge a better world. We had all these fears growing from U.S. hatred of Bolshevism, the Soviet uh, fear of, of Western intentions, their hatred of certain parts of capitalism, all this stuff was happening. But in 1946, this is where we get a series of events happen that really show that the Cold War is happening. You can argue it happened here. The first thing is the United States began a massive demobilization of their army. The U.S. had over 11 million men in uniform beginning of 45. By the end of 46, less than a million. I mean, the U.S. basically was going to get rid of their army like they did after every war. Yeah. So this is not in Potsdam. No, this is not Potsdam. Now this is 46. And they began reducing the army. There were actually riots of American soldiers in their occupation zone here in the summer of, or the winter of 45, 46. Because they're thinking, let us go home. And Americans were rioting at their bases. So we're pulling out. And then the realization hit, though, we're pulling out. But there's so, that big Soviet army is here, and they're leaving ruin. So while this is going on, that's it's no coincidence that the U.S. began massive demobilization, which later on, we, the U.S. will start building out its army again in the early 1950s. Cold War, total change. We started testing more nuclear bombs. So even though we're getting rid of the army, we're telling the Soviets, we still have these bombs, and we're making them better. In fact, they blew up a little tiny coral atoll Bikini. in the Pacific Island. What's it called? Bikini. Bikini Atoll. And yes, a French designer tried to revitalize French fashion designing, named a new bathing suit after that island that was blown up by nuclear weapons. So that's what Bikini is. It's a little island that was basically gone. They blew up the island, they also attacked ships in the island, they also uh, exploded an atomic bomb under the water to see what that would be in the ships. So, that's, so that, that, I've always found that ironic in a way. So, demobilization, but not only that, what happened was reparations. The U.S. said and the West, no reparations, it's ridiculous. The German occupation zone, or the... Uh, the Allied occupation zone in Germany, it was a wasteland. Absolute poverty. So no reparations. To Stalin, that's an act of war. Stalin saw this as confirming every one of his paranoid ideas of the West. So what did Stalin do? Stalin stripped the East, or East Germany, of every single thing of value. All right. If you're not going to give us reparations, we'll take everything of value from East Germany. And that's something that the Soviets, who had so little, the people, when they went to Germany and saw the luxury, that they, the relative luxury that the Germans lived in, as they took Germany, eastern part of Germany, made them even angrier. 
why did you come to our country and still when you have so much and we have so little? Just a follow point. So think about what they did. They went through and took everything. They took, for example, they took every rail, they took every piece of steel, they took every railroad tie from their occupation zone. They went to the Ottoman and cut off big chunks of the cement and put it on trains and sent them back to Russia. Which then they just threw away. Was, what do you do with big chunks of cement? But they were going to take them anyways. They went into homes and buildings and took any, that, any boards that were so intact, any furniture. They took nails out of broken boards and sent those back. Every single thing, drapes, uh, every, you know, copper pipes, wire, everything, including the kitchen sink. Because they didn't have kitchen sinks in most parts of Russia, so that became a big deal. And toilets, oh yeah, every toilet in the occupation zone was put on trains and sent back to the Soviet Union. So they stripped it completely. And it's going to make their life of the Germans even more miserable and send it back here. Well, to the American point of view, this is important to think about. Okay, they're setting up public governments. Now they're stripping it. That looks like this is part of the Soviet effort to do what? They're not creating a buffer zone because they're fearful invasion. They're doing this because what's the plan? Keep going and get it all. And so, in response to this, by not having elections, Truman. Oh, I almost forgot one more thing before that. Berlin, the Western occupation zones of Berlin, had to have these roads going through the Russian occupation zone. So they started doing things like this, shutting down the road to the British zone, saying it needed to be repaired. You know, just little inconveniences of Berlin, because Berlin's stuck in the Russian occupation zone. And that is when Truman had enough. He said, I'm going to have to stand up to Stalin. And that is when he cut off lend -Lease. Now, you read about lend -Lease and I talked about last week or Wednesday, didn't I? Didn't I mention lend -lease? Yeah. That A, they promised to keep giving lend -Lease for years after the war as kind of acknowledgement for the suffering that the Soviets did breaking the back of the German army. He cut off lend -Lease. Stalin, that's war. That solidified his effort to create puppet governments here. And you could argue that moment is the beginning of the Cold War. Because that is when all of a sudden it came out public that the grand coalition to defeat Nazi Germany has broken up. And now all of a sudden Stalin's an enemy. Yeah. What was the lend lease? Lend lease, that began right before the US entered World War II. But the US was going to give aid to anybody fighting tyranny, which meant Germany and then Japan. So the US was not going to worry about no loan, not going to worry about loans. We're just going to give food, oil, equipment. It implies that we're leasing, we're lending it, and we'll get it back when the war is done. Of course, we're not going to get spam back after the war is done. When you eat it, it's gone. But that's what happened. And so what 46 all of a sudden is like this shock. It's no coincidence that once you have this, you have the, and combined with this domestic political issue, going into 47, you have the beginning of the second Red Scare. Total war does not shut off. And lastly, last thing for today. Going into 1947, then, as the U.S. is demobilizing, all of a sudden it looked like the Soviets were expanding in other areas. There was already a scare the Soviets pulled out, but in Iran. And the U.S. is going to become obsessed with or The U.S. will eventually become obsessed with Iran and the communists there. And the British controlled all of Iranian oil, so they kind of got involved in that. This will have no future implications to this day. Don't worry. As in a disaster is coming. But Greece was the biggie. After the war, Britain put in a military dictatorship in Greece. Britain wanted to make sure that Greece would be loyal or friends of, of Britain. The reason why they put in a military dictatorship there 
is because this almost immediately they started fighting a very active communist, sorry, guerrilla force. These communist guerrillas that fought the Nazis who occupied it in 41, and now they're fighting this military dictatorship. And that's why they didn't want a democracy, because they thought the communists would win. Now, in 1947, Britain, that was just, yeah. Okay, why could they put a military dictatorship in Greece? Greece was neutral. No, Greece wasn't neutral. Oh. In World War II, Germany took Greece in 1941. World War One, they were yeah. neutral. Well, 1947, last thing for today, Britain informed the United States, we can't afford to pay for this dictatorship. The communists will take over Greece. This is one of these moments, looking back, where you go, think about, think about it before you leave. Think before you leave. Have a great day. Right when you find work, try to get through the weekend. Why are you Is it a nice pencil? Can I have a hot cake? Yes, you can have it. I'll say why not. Is it? It won't mention it again, but it's McCarthy. Is. McCarthy. It become. It become. You know, really, yeah, it makes sense. An AP lit, or AP language. Uh, no. No. Good. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. You know, goodly doing anything. Goodly doing. Yeah. <laughs> Five minutes left, and I'll say, please time out. I knew that part was coming. That'd be a great spot to stop. Do you like the video? Oh, yeah. And didn't it become awful really quick? And you're going, oh my goodness, what an awful man. It was really yeah, that's the first part I was like, did I lie? Like, I might have joined. And then the second part, oh my god. At first, he just said, I'm going to leave this rest. very, very messy. And that one scene about when he's they're humiliating that woman and he's kind of looking over his glasses and the way he did that, I thought, oh, what an awful person. Why does he wear glasses all the time? Just to like. Oh, we're so feminine. <laughs> 